When, we, when, we're, when we're taught the Dhamma, when we, when we read how the Buddha uh, presented his teachings, then we're, we're presented with many different uh, frameworks, many different perspectives. And um, I find it's very interesting that, that if we look at how the early teachings are presented in the suttas, which seems to you know, it seems to represent how the Buddha himself taught, that, that you get these different frameworks, different angles, and um, you're not always told how, they, how they're supposed to relate to each other. Yeah? So, I mean, the, traditionally we understand that the Buddha spoke, of course, many different times, in many different contexts, to many different people. And so he would always uh, adjust his teaching to suit the characters of the people he was te speaking to. And this is, uh, of course, very natural. And uh, any, any good teacher would try to do the same thing. And so we find that, that uh, <coughs> um, the same teachings, the same themes crop up again and again and again and again. Some things only maybe happen once. Okay? So maybe there's one particular uh, circumstance where the Buddha responded in a particular way, uh, which we don't find repeated elsewhere. Other times we find things repeated over and over and over again. And so you get these kind of um, many different, it's like prisms or different, different angles on the Dhamma, and somehow then that has to be, we have this idea in our mind of what the Dhamma is, which is made up of all these different kinds of um, prisms, all these different reflections. And uh, of course, this is why everybody has a different Dhamma, yeah? because we all put that together in, in a different way. And so we hear the teachings, the Four Noble Truths, or the Eightfold Path, or we hear uh, Anicca Dukkha Anatta, impermanent suffering and not self. Or we hear uh, the Four Brahma Viharas. Uh, loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. We hear teachings on um, uh, uh, the four elements or on dependent origination. And uh, in our own way, we, we take those teachings and, and kind of digest them and apply them or understand them. And... Uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, when, when you've got a Buddha around, right, you don't have to bother with that. <laughs> Life is much easier. You just go and see the Buddha and say, Hey, Buddha, what do I need to know? Right? Forget all the rubbish. Just tell me, what do I need to know right now? And this happened very often. We find that in the suttas. Very often somebody came to the Buddha and said, Lord, I want to go and practice. I really want to devote myself to seclusion. I really want to give myself fully to the Dhamma. Please give me some teaching I can take with me, and the Buddha will give a, a teaching, you know, for that particular person in that particular time. And so we're a bit stuck, aren't we? We don't have a Buddha, and 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 uh, we've got all these teachings which just kind of seem to grow and grow and grow and grow. And where do we start? Is this oceans of Dhamma, and we sort of plunge in there, and we don't know. We're swimming around. We think, where's the orientation? Where do I go? Where, where's up? Where's down? And we're talking with um, one of our, our friends at the monastery, Noel. He's a, a pilot. And he was saying, you know, when, the, when, the, when, you're doing, when the plane goes into free fall, one of the big problems is you don't know which direction is up. Yeah? And so he's a, he's a pilot for Qantas. So next time you're flying on Qantas, he might be there. But you also have to know he's, he's also a... a, a, a uh, he could have won the Australian Aerobatics Championships or something like that. So if you're on Qantas and they start doing loop-the-loops or something like that <laughs> next time, then maybe it's Noel in the cockpit. He does try to restrain himself, though. But he said, you know, if you, when, you go, when you start plunging, you go into free fall. He said the way they, they joke about it is that they, you, you carry a cat in the, in, the, in the cockpit with you because they always land on their feet. So if you don't know which way is up, you throw the cat in the air and see which way it goes, you know. <laughs> And so sometimes we're like that when it comes to Dhamma, you know, we're like, we're, we're, we're in free fall. 
and we don't know where to get the orientation. And uh, the good part about that is that when we, um, when we start to understand and we like go behind and underneath these teachings, we start to realize that there are certain patterns which emerge, okay? And that these patterns are not arbitrary. They're not just, they're not just a, an invented thing by the Buddha, but they, but they connect on a very deep level with our own reality, with our own minds, our own lives. And so this kind of validates the patterns. And, uh, and so this is part of that process of learning to understand the Dharma at a more deep level. And so when, you, when, you, when, when we start to understand and to see in that, this way, we can actually almost pick up just about any Dhamma teaching and then find the whole of the Dhamma open up inside that. And probably the most extravagant example of this was the um, Visuddhimagga, a very famous manual of Dhamma composed in Sri Lanka in the 5th uh, century. And it's, it's almost, it's almost Visuddhimagga is quite cheeky, I think, because it starts out with a verse. And the verse goes something like, um, uh, a tangle within, a tangle without, this whole world is, is caught in a tangle. And, and something, I can't remember the end of the verse, but like the Buddha, the Buddha taught us the way to, to untangle the tangle, or how do we untangle this tangle. So it's just a little verse like that with a little paradox. We're caught in this tangle, how do we untie it? And then it says, well, now I'm going to explain that. And then the rest of the Visuddhimagga is like this book this thick, is like the explanation for that verse. So he sets it up like a commentary on that little verse and opens up the whole of the Dharma within that. And uh, it's very beautiful, yeah? And it's very, it, it, it tells us something very profound about the nature of the Dhamma. And uh, even in just that tiny little thing, we can find a bit of letting go. Within that tiny little fragment, tiny little piece of the Dhamma, we can go inside and find everything. So one... one um, one of these frameworks or perspectives on the Dhamma that uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier uh, was this, this idea of, um, they talk about Sila Bhatta Paramasa, <coughs> and um, this is Pali phrase, and um, meaning, they usually translate it as attachment to rites and rituals. Okay, I'll come back to that in a minute, but this is part of a, a set of Dhammas Called the ten fetters. Okay, so Buddhism, of course, has got lots. Like we like making lists in Buddhism. You've got the ten these and the seven those and the eight ones of these and the four ones of those and the five ones of those. And of course, this is a mnemonic device. This helps you to remember. And the early days of Buddhism, everything was memorized. Okay, so we didn't have Google. Right? You can say, well, "What was that thing now?" Okay, so you Google it, you get it back. You don't have to remember anything. Right? You can externalize your mind. Yeah? Your mind is actually projected externally. This is what books do, and internet and so on. It allows us to keep our, the contents of our mind externally. And uh, Einstein commented on that once. He said, you know, why bother, you know, why, I never bother learning my times tables. You know, I look it up in a book. <laughs> yeah? And so those kinds of things we can externalize, which is not a bad thing. It frees us up for, for other things which can't be externalized. And so, but in those days, everything was memorized. And uh, there is something to that. There is something which is quite important about memorizing the Dhamma. It's something which I've done quite a lot of. And when I was a young monk uh, in Thailand, I used to love to memorize suttas. And I, I'd memorize many long suttas, you know, and uh, both in English and also in Pali. And I would love to, to chant them and, and so on. And... Uh, even though I don't have the, the time to do that these days. But uh, there's still a lot of that stays with you. And, and it comes back very quickly. It's very good training for the mind. I guess for myself it's something that I learned as a musician because when you're playing music, of course, you, you learn how to remember things. Yeah? And you can remember songs very easily. And sometimes, you know, when you've been playing music for many years, you notice that it just trains. You can just play through a song two or three times and then you'll remember it. Yeah? It, it becomes very easy. Uh, and so with that, that memory allows you to recall the Dhamma very quickly. 
Of course, this is the problem, isn't it? You know, when the defilements actually come up in your heart, <laughs> oh, there's anger there. What did the Buddha say how to get rid of anger? Hang on, let's let me look up the book now and uh, find it there. It's not there, is it? Yeah? So you need to know inside your mind. So one of these sets of dhammas, the ten sanyojanas, ten fetters. And uh, the word sanyojana is... is um, from the root. The root meaning of it is uh, from the same root as yoga. Okay, so we know yoga is, you know, we think of yoga today as being, you know, doing physical exercises and so on. Uh, but that, of course, that's only one aspect of it. And yoga in Indic tradition is a word for spiritual practice generally. Okay, but the, the root meaning of the word yoga is the same as the English word yoke, not as in the egg yoke, but as in the yoke that ties a team of oxen together or, 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 or cattle together. You yoke them together. Okay, and um, probably originally had that meaning. The the ancient Aryan people who lived maybe you know maybe two thousand years before the Buddha uh, tamed horses. Okay, and one of their key techn technological innovations was to yoke two horses together with a chariot. Yeah, and so this is what they used, and this is what this was the the high tech military technology of the day: yoking two horses together. And then they, they invented the, the art of blitzkrieg, basically. They, would, they were so much faster than everybody else. They would just lightning strike into the villages and so on, raid them, take off, you know, rape all the women, grab all the, 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 the booty and so on, and then uh, disappear before anyone knew what had happened to them. So this was the ancient Aryan people. And they, this is one of the meanings of yoke. So it had those two, from the very earliest days, had these two... Uh, connotations. One is of tying together, right? And then the other one is of of uh, uh, concerted action, yeah, of, a, of, a, of an action to do something. And uh, still in in Pali and in spiritual circles, it still has those two meanings. One one meaning of a yoga is to uh, to spiritual practice generally. And uh, the Yoga Sutra, uh, Patanjali starts out saying yoga means the cessation of the activities of the mind. It's a very famous definition of what yoga is. The ending, the quieting of the activities of the mind is yoga. And uh, <clears throat> so it has this meaning in Buddhism also. And the other meaning that yoga has and words derived from it is something of, that's, that's a, a tying us up. Okay? Okay, so like, like the... Um, uh, cattle or the oxen are, are yoked together, so we're tied up. So a kind of bondage. So one time when I was I was on the um, setting up a, a website for the uh, a Yahoo group for the Australian Sangha Association, and I had putting on a, a quote there from the suttas, and it had some words something like freedom from all bondage, and then it wouldn't let me put that onto the website because it was just a <laughs> it got censored. I couldn't say that. Okay, so. So it has those two meanings, yeah. Both uh, 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 spiritual effort, spiritual striving, and also something that locks us and ties us up into suffering. So that's 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 actually in itself an interesting point to remember because um, the root of that word, of course, is a metaphor. Okay, you've got an actual thing, right, in the real world which is like a harness which is tied onto horses. Okay? It's a physical object. And from that we derive metaphors. But the physical object itself has an ambiguity about it. Okay? Because on the one hand it restricts what those horses can do. From the horse's point of view, it's a tying, it's a bondage. Yeah? But from the rider's point of view, it enables them to do things. It enables an action. Yeah? So even the physical concrete thing is ambiguous already. Yeah? How much more so is the metaphor that we use? Yeah? So very important to remember these things because these, so often we take the metaphor for reality. We interpret it in just one way. But it's not like that. We can actually use the metaphors from different ways and different perspectives. And so this metaphor of yoga and tying up is used from those two different perspectives. One is being locked up in the tangle. And then the other way, other means is 
something which is directing us and, and uh, uh, enabling us to free ourselves from suffering. So these ten sanyojanas, okay, the word sanyojana from the same root, are uh, one of the um, one of the descriptions or one of the frameworks that the Buddha used for talking about our defilements. Okay, and so again, this idea of defilements is very important to understand. This uh, sometimes. Um, there's a, there's a kind of an argument or a conflict in Buddhism, and people argue about sometimes is our mind uh, inherently defiled? Okay, and now in some um, teachings, it seems as if that's the case. For example, in dependent origination, it starts out with ignorance. Okay, ignorance is the root of everything, and then there's sankharas, there's the activities of the mind, the volitions, and then there's consciousness, and so on and so forth. So it seems as if defilements are at the root of everything. Okay. In other contexts, the Buddha said the mind is radiant yeah, and is only um, defiled by passing defilements. Yeah? So in that case, it seems as if the mind maybe is naturally pure. So then we wonder which, which, which one of those is true. And of course, the answer is neither of them is true. Yeah? But both of them are true from a certain perspective. Neither of them is true in an absolute sense. But both of them are useful ways of looking at the mind. What's actually true is that the mind is defiled or purified according to causes and conditions. Okay? It's not the nature of the mind to be either defiled or to be pure. The nature of the mind is to be affected by conditions. So we use the simile of like water. Okay? We say, is water naturally pure or naturally dirty? Yeah? Well, it's naturally both, isn't it? You know, you can go out in nature, you find dirty water. You go out in nature, you find pure and clean water. Yeah, both of those things are there in nature, and we can't say that 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 water is naturally one or two, one of those things. But what we can say is that when there are there things there to pollute the water, it will be polluted. When there are things not no things to pollute it, it will be clear. Yeah. So it depends on the context. It depends on the conditions. So the mind is exactly the same. If the conditions are right for polluting the mind, it will be polluted. If the conditions are right for the purifying of the mind, it will be purified. And that's the nature of the mind. Okay? The nature of the mind is to be conditioned. So whenever we think about these defilements, these two are also... Um, both positive and negative, okay? depending on which way we look at it. Just like the, the idea of a, a yoke can be either positive or negative, depending on our perspective. Okay? In the same way, uh, you know, we can look at each one of the defilements. It's just when we use the word defilement or, or, or obstructions or hindrances or fetters, you know, many, many different words for these things. Uh, it's just a name, it's just a label for a particular aspect or quality of the mind. That's all. And we can use a negative label or we can use a um, positive label. Doesn't really, either way uh, works. So, for example, we talk about greed, hatred and delusion. Yeah? So this is a classic, the three fires the Buddha talked about or the three poisons sometimes uh, also described as. And these... Uh, Three fires um, also have their positive. You can be expressed in the same way in a positive sense. Okay, so we can express the greed uh, in the, the, the positive or the, the 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 bright side of greed is is letting go and giving and charity. Yeah? Hatred, the bright side of that is loving kindness and compassion, and delusion, the bright side of that is uh, clarity and wisdom of mind. Yeah. So we can talk about letting go greed or we can talk about developing generosity and, and uh, renunciation. We can talk about letting go of hatred and anger or we can talk about developing metta and loving kindness. We can talk about letting go of delusion and ignorance or we can talk about developing wisdom and, and clarity of mind. Both of those perspectives are, are equally useful. Okay? 
and uh, it isn't the case that one is true or better than the other. Actually, what's better is to use both. And so this is what the Buddha did, to, to really kind of balance these things. And we see that the way the Buddha presented in the suttas, again, again and again and again, he would present these things in both the negative sense and the positive sense. Okay? And usually the format of the suttas would start out with the negative side, he'd present the dark side first, and then he'd present the positive side. And there's hundreds and hundreds of, of discourses that are, that are formulated in this way. Presenting the dark side, okay, we understand that, and then presenting the bright side. Yeah? So we're kind of uplifted by that. So these ten sangyojanas, ten fetters, are one of the frameworks the Buddha used for talking about the defilements, problems, obscurities, the fires, the poisons, the floods, and so on that he used. Uh, different metaphors for talking about the problems in the mind. And the particular uh, angle or um, the particular uh, um, context that these appear in is talking about the different stages of enlightenment. Okay? So, again, we have this kind of positive and negative thing. We can talk about the presence or absence of different kinds of defilements, or we can talk about the presence or absence of different kinds of purity of mind, okay? which, which a person might attain through their spiritual practice. Just the same thing. And uh, so the first three of these fetters, Sila Bhatta Paramasa, attachment to rites and rituals, Sakaya Dirti, is uh, views of a, a real existing self, and um, Riti Kicha is doubt. And these three fetters, these three first fetters, are abandoned by the stream enterer. So you may have heard of the, the stream enterer, the Sotapanna. In Thai, they call Sotapan, and in, in Sinhala, Sowan. In English, we usually translate it as a stream enterer. And so this image of the stream itself is a very, is a very ambiguous image. And in Buddhism, is used in both ways. We find the stream is used in the sense of like a flood which is going to take us away and drown us. Okay? It's used in a negative sense. It's also used in a very positive sense. The stream is like the great rivers that fill up, and the, the, the streams that fill up and they flow down to the great rivers. The great rivers fill up and then they flow down to the ocean. And the ocean is a simile for Nibbana in that case. So the stream also is used in, a, in those two ways. So in this case, this, the entry to the stream is the positive side, the freedom from the, the, the fetters is expressing it in a negative way. So attachment to rites and rituals, they say sila bhatta paramasa, doesn't mean attachment to rites and rituals at all. Where did that translation come from? I don't know. Maybe it came from uh, some kind of Western modernist who, who was trying to reject, reject kind of religion and have, present Buddhism as a secular philosophy or something like that. But Sila Bhatta Paramasa doesn't really have... Uh, it's kind of not totally different from that, but it's quite, quite a poor translation. Anyway, Sila, right? First, if you analyze the compound, sila, right? you know what sila is? Precepts, ethics, virtue. Yeah? So don't be attached to ethics. Don't be attached to your pre. So when you say, you know, don't be attached to rites and rituals, often that's interpreted, and especially kind of Western or modernist Buddhists interpret that as meaning that you shouldn't do rites and rituals, right? There's something wrong with it. Rites and rituals are wrong. That's how it's often interpreted. But when you realize it doesn't say rites and rituals, that actually says precepts. Okay? Okay, ethics. Okay? So it's clearly, it's not saying don't keep precepts, I hope. <laughs> yeah? And sila bata. Bata is, is a, um, uh, a term meaning um, vows. Okay? And a vow is something like, um, uh, could be interpreted in many ways. It could be, for example, you know, you take your monastic vows. The, lit the literal meaning of it, which 
which is directly presented in that way in the suttas is things like, and one example they give is the, the dog duty, it translated as the dog duty ascetic. Okay? And so the word for duty is actually the vow here. Okay? So the dog vow ascetic. So it's a particular kind of ascetic who decides, I'm going to live like a dog. Right? And so they rip off all their clothes, crawl around on all, floor, on all fours, bark, and you know, eat out of what's thrown on the ground, and, and so on and so forth. And they just do everything like a dog. Right? Now, this is a particular class of ascetic that was around in the Buddha's day. Now, you might think that this is a bit silly. Okay? And you might think that it couldn't possibly have happened. Right? Nobody would be that dumb. But I read in the newspaper a little while ago, a few years ago now, of a, a Russian uh, artist, performance artist, who actually did an installation at the New York Museum of Modern Art. And he, when he was flying into New York, he first he just got through the customs. And as soon as he got through the customs, he immediately threw off all his clothes, got down on all floor, or fours and started barking. Right? And then they had to put a collar around his neck and a leash and then take him off and then put him into the New York Museum of Modern Art. They tied him up. He just did his business on the floor there. They'd put dog food in the bowl and he just lived there right, for a week or two weeks or something being a, being a dog. Oh. <laughs> Modern art, yeah. But interesting that, that what was... I mean, it's actually an, an interesting social comment that what in the Buddha's day was considered to be a spiritual practice of some kind now is an artistic installation. That kind of shift is actually quite, a, quite interesting, quite a significant one. And uh, when one of these dog duty ascetics came to the Buddha and said, you know, I've heard that, that if you do this, you can work off all your bad karma and get, get enlightened. And what do you think, Buddha? And the Buddha said, well, I really would rather if you didn't ask me that question. He said, no, nah, go on, go on, tell me, tell me. He said, I really wish you wouldn't ask me that question. He says, go on, go on. He says, okay, if you insist, if you perfect that practice, you get reborn as a dog. <laughs> so he's a bit upset by that. Yeah. So that's the, the literal meaning of what the, the vata is. Of course, that's a, that's a very extreme case, but you get the idea of what it means. It means um, making some kind of determination, some kind of resolution, I'm going to keep this particular kind of practice or something like that. Okay, So you decide maybe, you know, and people still do that a lot in, in Buddhism, don't you? People maybe make a vow to, say, be vegetarian. Okay, So I'm going to be vegetarian now and I'm going to do that. Or... They say, okay, I'm going to make a vow to go to the monastery uh, and offer dana once a week or something like that or whatever it may be. Many different, different kinds of things people say. And particularly if you're in the monastic communities and people really like doing these kinds of things. So you always kind of, people thinking of more and more complicated kinds of ways of torturing themselves. You know, I'm going to uh, not eat anything except like 10 lumps of sticky rice for the whole rains retreat. Right? Or I'm only going to accept whatever's put in my bowl outside of the monastery. Okay? If anything's put into my bowl inside the monastery, I'm not going to eat it. I'm not going to accept it. Only what's in the village or something like that, whatever happens, then I'll eat that. Or um, you know, uh, somebody makes a vow during the hot season. There's a retreat on in the hot season, so they'll make a vow to like, wear their, all of their robes in the hot season. So they can sit there and... or you know, to sit up all night or something like that. So monks like to do these kinds of things. Um, and, you know, can be fun. <laughs> Gives you something to do anyway, you know, breaks the monotony of life. Uh, and occasionally it might even have some benefits. And... Uh, well, another monk I used to uh, no, uh, no, he, he, he used to live in, living in a monastery where they were uh, down the bottom of the hill and they had to walk for an hour up to the top of the hill. And you know this is a real hassle. You're in it's in Thailand. 
it's really hot. You go down, you, only, you have this meal of sticky rice and you're really exhausted after the meal and then you've got to climb all the way up there. And he used to fill his backpack full of rocks, <laughs> carry rocks up to the top of the hill. That's his vow. Or, or you know, anyway, you get the idea. So, I mean, these things can be useful if, they're, um, if there's a point to it. Yeah? And I remember when we visited, with a group of monks, we visited uh, Ajahn Mahabua's monastery in northeastern Thailand. So if you know anything about the Thai forest tradition, you, you know that Ajahn Mahabua has this reputation for being like really super duper tough. Like he's, he's, the, he's the kickboxing monk, right? He used to be a kickboxer and he still talks like that. Get in the ring, give those defilements a kick, smash them, get them down on the ground, kick their head in, and all these kinds of stuff. And this is how he teaches. And uh, it was interesting when, when we were there, we were speaking with a monk called Ajahn Panyawado, who's passed away a couple of years ago. But he was, the, he was an English monk. Now, he was actually the most senior Western monk. And he'd been with Ajahn Mahabu for like 30 or 40 years at that time, certainly over 30 years. And uh, very, very lovely monk and very funny because he's still totally, totally English. And he'd been living in the middle of northeast Thailand in the jungles for like 35 years or 40 years and he's still totally plummy English accent. And uh, uh, very, very funny. And, but this was one of the things, that, the points that he made. And we went up there with a the group of the young Western monks and... You know, I think probably maybe he knew that their, their character, and he he said, he said, you know, he said doing these kinds of ascetic practices and so on, they're useful um, if 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 they can counteract or help to overcome certain specific defilements and problems. Okay, if you're not doing that, then it's a total waste of time. Okay, and in fact, it's 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 dangerous because it becomes an ego trip. It becomes something to do in, instead of... It's, it's something to do actually a lot from lack of faith. And this is what I see a lot, is people want to do things. Why? Because they don't have faith that the Eightfold Path is actually working. But the Eightfold Path really does work. And if we have the patience and the faith to practice that, then we have to allow... Give it its time. Give it its time. Give it the, the, the devotion and the um, care, and it will work, okay? But we just have to be patient with that. So this is the kind of thing that, that the Buddha was talking about when he's talking about sila bhata paramasa, okay? The word paramasa uh, means something like misapprehension, okay? So misapprehension of uh, virtue or precepts and vows, Okay? I think the Bhikkhu Bodhi maybe translates it that way these days, like misapprehension of virtue and vows. And uh, this is a much better uh, translation of it. So what that means is that we don't misunderstand the externals of our religious practice. Okay? And there's a very uh, uh, important passage in the uh, Atakavaga of the... Uh, no, sorry, in, in the Solasapanha of the, the Sutta Nipata. And uh, the Buddha says... You know, you can't get enlightened just by doing sila and vata, okay, by doing precepts and vows, nor can you get enlightened without doing sila and vata, okay? So this is the thing that's very important to remember. You can't get enlightened just by doing that, nor can you get enlightened by not doing it, okay? We do, we keep our precepts, yeah? We have our spiritual resolutions, we dedicate ourselves to the path, but we don't get attached to that. We don't think that by doing these things in and of themselves that I'm going to solve my problems. Okay? It's just a, a, um, a part of the path. It's an aspect of the path. So the second one of these, the first three fetters, we call Sakaya Ditti. And Sakaya Ditti, uh, the word here, Sakaya, means um, <clears throat> something like identity. Okay? And uh, these days, uh, the, tra the translators Bhikkhu Bodhi, I think, uses identity view. So the word ditti means, literally means a view. Okay, Sanskrit drishti. And it's used to mean like a theory or something like that. So these days in Thai, um, uh, you know, like if you have like the theory of evolution or something like that, it would be the, uh, what's it, the Tritsidi Hankwam Wiwat, Hankan Wiwat is the, the theory of evolution. 
So dipti means something about a theory, an opinion, a view. And Sakaya Dipti is an identity view. So what this means is that we identify ourselves with something. Okay? What do we identify ourselves with? My body. I am my body. I am my mind. I am my soul. I am my family. I am my DNA. That's a good one, isn't it? These days, people, you think, you think you're, you're your DNA. Yeah? And uh, we think we can, we can keep alive by uh, keeping our descendants. We have children, and, they have children, and we, we somehow we, we perpetuate ourselves like that. And you can even keep Granny alive by splicing her DNA into an apple tree. It's true. You can, you, there's, a, there's a thing now you can do. You can, you can get, get, when Granny dies, you can get her DNA, splice it into an apple's DNA, grow a tree. It gives a whole new meaning to the word Granny's apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> And so somehow we feel that Granny's still there because she's growing in the backyard. Yeah? <laughs> I don't know. It sounds a bit weird to me. But uh, so we, ad we identify with all of these things. And we do this almost on a kind of a reflex basis. But what this Sakai Ditti means is something a bit more developed than, than simple... Uh, conceit or, or, or that kind of the basic sense of, of me. So Kaya Ditti is more of a kind of a developed sense where we actually consciously, so Kaya Ditti is like a conscious idea of self, okay? Um, and, you know, off, and, 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 that, and that's something that's developed both internally and also through culture, okay? So through culture we identify myself, I am an Australian, okay? I am a uh, a man or a woman. I am a, a you know. I, I play. I'm a cricket player. I'm a, I'm a whatever. I belong to this club, and and these are like external sort of conscious identifications. Okay, uh, and of course, on a more more profound level, we identify with our our thoughts. Yeah, I am my thoughts. It's very interesting if you notice that. You know, one of the one of the characteristics of intellectual discourse is that a person who has a thought always finds that thought more persuasive than everybody else. Yeah? So if you're uh, discussing something or arguing something, it seems totally clear to you. This idea that I've got, it's perfectly logical and makes perfect sense, but to everybody else it seems like rubbish, you know? And uh, why is it that that thought seems more real, more true to you in, than, than it does to other people? In some way, that thought has its own glow, it has this, this, this numinous quality about it, which comes from the fact that it's identified with me. Yeah? It's part of me. I am. I am. Yeah? <laughs> there is this isness here, this, 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 this being, this, this, this soul, and this thought emerges from that. Yeah? And it has the, it's surrounded by the glory of being part of me. This thought is bestowed with the wonderful glory of being part of my splendor. <laughs> Hence, you should all be persuaded by it. Yeah? Inherently, without having to actually explain it or anything. So this is how our minds work, isn't it? So we identify with those things. And uh, so uh, thoughts are emotions, okay? And so we, 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 we feel a lot of things. And this is something which I think is, uh, has been pointed out and I think is a valid uh, criticism of much of modern Buddhism, Western Buddhism, and there's a very um, uh, memorable phrase is that the narcissism of feelings, Okay? The narcissism of feeling. So what that means is that if I feel anything, it must be real. 
it, I, all I have to do is feel it enough, emote it enough, and then it's real, it's true, it's me. Yeah? And so this is an idea which ultimately comes from, in Western Buddhism, comes, of course, Western Buddhism had its roots in the whole hippie era, and it sort of evolved from that. And so this is a kind of a hangover from that kind of idea. From a Buddhist perspective, it is much more nuanced than that. From a Buddhist perspective, it says that if uh, you're in a context where you're... Uh, say your intellectual or thinking mind has been developed very strongly, yeah, which often is the case in fact in the West, yeah, that when we go to school and so on, we're taught how to think, we're taught how to intellectualize and everything, we're not taught how to manage our emotions. Okay? So if that's the case, then yes, we need to also learn to develop our emotional side. And so in that case, Buddhism would say, yeah, you know, develop your emotions, learn how to experience them, feel them, and all of those kinds of things as part of our balanced mental development. But not to say that, you know, then to take that to the extreme of saying, you know, anything that you feel, you know, must be true and, 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 and anything, if you think something, then it's not true, okay? So this is, we don't set up that kind of dichotomy, but it's more like seeking a sense of balance, yeah? So this is another way that we can... Um, uh, get attached or form this this uh, identity view, <clears throat> and notice how this also connects with the first one, with the sila Paramasa, because we we identify with our spiritual practice, okay, and that's something that's very very important to to be careful of and to watch out for. I am a monk, right? <laughs> I've got a shaven head and I wear robes and stuff like that. Therefore, this is me, yeah. I can identify with it. And in a sense, it's, that's quite natural. Yeah? We all do that, so we don't have to make a problem out of it, but we need to be aware of it. There is that tendency. And the, the last one, of running out of time here, but the last one of these three fetters is the fetter of doubt, witty kicha. And... Uh, there's some nice words for doubt. In Pali, has some nice words. One of them is uh, katankata, which means what, what, yeah, <laughs> what, what, katankata. And uh, witty kichar is is like a um, is itself a very interesting formation. It's what they call a desiderative reduplication. And so you take the root, the root meaning to cure, okay, and then you duplicate that. So it's like a doubled, but with an, with, with, a, with an implication of wanting to, okay? So it's like a wanting to cure, but being doubled. So wanting to cure in different ways. And then the V is added on the beginning, and the V, again, has the implication of, like, division, okay? It's like the V it sort of divides out and sends in different directions. So you're kind of wanting to solve things in different kinds of ways, but you're not really sure which way you need to solve things in, yeah? And uh, the great example of, of witchy kitcha or doubt, I've told the stories before, but it's a very good one, is, is that of Chogyam Trumpa, who was the uh, very famous Tibetan teacher in uh, America in the 1970s. And uh, one day he was uh, driving his uh, car along the road and uh, he was coming to a fork in the road. And he knew that on the right-hand fork, if he went up there, was the meditation center. And the retreat was on. He would be able to go there, join the meditation center and do his meditation. On the left side of the fork was a really good party. Okay? And he could go there and meet people and get drunk and all of those kinds of things. And he was driving down the road and he didn't know which way. And so he ended up driving down the middle and smashing into a tree. <laughs> so this is doubt. You're better off going to the party, okay? If you really can't decide... <laughs> At least, if you go to, at least you might say, so, yeah, maybe you, something good might happen. It's better than smashing into a tree anyway. Yeah? So sometimes you have to, you have to choose something. Yeah? Just, just, doubt is okay. Yeah? That, 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 that having a period of doubt is okay. Yeah? You kind of hold that. But it can't be too much. Yeah? You can't live your whole life in doubt. There has to be a moment of decision. And uh, doubt, it's interesting that in Buddhism, you know, we think in, you know, I've been talking about the, 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 the complementary pairs, the way dhammas are presented. 
Now, we normally think of the, the, the complementary pair of doubt being faith, especially in religious context. And so there's some truth to that. But in Buddhism, the, the opposite of doubt is more often presented as being inquiry. Okay? The opposite of doubt is inquiry. And that's quite interesting because often we think it's exactly the opposite, isn't it? Actually, we cause doubts by inquiry. And I had a friend who is now a monk. He used to study theology in, in England. And he said that in the theology department at the university, they had the joke, that the, 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 the house joke in the theology department was that studying theology was the quickest way to make you lose your faith. <laughs> so in Buddhism, we don't think that way. Yeah? And uh, inquiry helps you to overcome your doubts. Okay? Because with inquiry, with real inquiry, what you do is you trace back cause and effect. Okay? You understand things in terms of cause and effect. If there's this, then there must be that. If there's that, there must be this. And you start to see these patterns. It's not something which happens all at once. It's not something you can just do or impose on your mind. It's something that comes from long and patient observation. Yeah? Seeing the patterns. Oh, okay, this kind of seed will give rise to this kind of plant. Yeah? Oh, okay. If I act in this way, then people will respond to it in that way. Yeah? If I do this in my meditation, it has that kind of result. Yeah? And we observe these patterns again and again and again, and we inquire into that. And gradually we learn to overcome our doubt, little bit by little bit by little bit. And so this, is these, this, this, um, this twofold aspect of faith and reason is resolved in Buddhism with the phrase, akaravati sadha, is reasoned faith. Okay? And so this is what we try to develop in Buddhism, reasoned faith, and not andasadha, is um, blind faith. So that reasoned faith, akaravati sadha, we develop through inquiry. Sometimes it literally means inquiry. Sometimes it means we, we don't know the answer to a Dhamma question or we have a problem or something, we can ask. Yeah? Ask somebody, okay, what's the answer to this? We try to look it up. And sometimes it's a matter of investigating within ourselves. So it can be an external inquiry or an internal inquiry. And what that process of inquiry and overcoming doubts, it, it binds up with those other two factors. Because when we uh, inquire, okay, we learn, okay, this, this the sila and bata, the, the precepts and the vows, we learn to understand these. Okay? We learn to understand, okay, if I keep my precepts, then my mind is like this. If I don't keep the precepts, then my mind is like that. We watch, yeah? We watch for the causes and conditions. Okay? So we then we don't get attached to the externals. And it also helps us to overcome our view of self because the more we investigate conditionality, the more we realize that there is no core abiding essence that, you know, that is me. And so, you know, we do we identify with our feelings. But then we think, hang on, you know, if I how, how can I be my feelings? Because when I, I act like this, I feel like that, and when I act like that, I feel I'm like that. But I'm still here. <laughs> my feelings have changed, but I, I, I'm, I'm still around. You know, my thoughts have changed, my ideas have changed, but somehow I'm still here. And so, through that process, we gradually let go of these things, and the. The outcome of that process or the, the, the result of that is what we call stream entry. Okay? So somebody who's managed to overcome or abandon those three defilements completely, fully in their heart, we call it a stream enterer. And that moment of stream entry, which is the, the, the outcome of that process, the Buddha said that, that that moment is like a flash of lightning in the dark night. Okay? A flash of lightning in the dark of night. Suddenly, the truth reveals itself. Yeah? And it reveals itself to say that it has been here all along. Those things that we knew all along. Yeah? Nothing new. We're not learning anything new. It is always there. Somehow, in our heart, it's been there. It's been there since the first time we heard the Dhamma. It's surely been there even longer than that. It's been there whispering in our ears for our whole lives. In the Buddhism, it talks about the divine messengers, you know, seeing, seeing a sick person or a dead person. Yeah? 
These are the, these are the teachings for us. Yeah, when you die, according to the Buddha, Buddhism, has this this wonderful sutta talking about what happens to you after you die. And in Indian mythology, they have Yama, the god of the dead. And uh, so, according to Buddhism, when you die, you go up and you see Yama, the god of the dead, right? But Yama is not uh, uh, judge, He's not punishing you, right? He's not even judging you, okay? Yama sort of sits there. You go up and you see Yama, and Yama says, how's it going? You say, oh, it's all right. Well, I'm dead, you know. <laughs> it's as it is. And uh, Yama says, well, did, you know, how, did, how did you live your life? Yeah? Did, you, did you live a good life? He said, well, you know, it was kind of all right. Yeah, I did some good things, some bad things. He said, but did you see the, the lessons that I sent down for you? you know? He says, oh, what, what do you mean? He said, well, didn't you, didn't you see a, a dead person? You know, I, I sent this as a message for you. Yeah? And didn't you see that and didn't you reflect, oh, I too will die. Yeah? This is my nature. I need to live my life well right now. And then the fellow goes, well, no, actually. I, I, I didn't learn that lesson particularly well. He said, mm -hmm. well, what about the other lesson? I sent you a sick person. Yeah? And this was another teacher for you. Yeah? Did you. Did you listen to your teacher? Well, no, not really. Yeah? And so then at the end, Yama fall, falls silent. Yeah, it's not Yama's job to judge you or to punish you, just to inquire. Yeah? And you know for yourself. Yeah? We know for, you know for yourself already. Yeah? We've already learnt these lessons in so many past lives. Yeah? We've just forgotten. We need to remind ourselves. Yeah? And that process of inquiry will gradually unfold the truth, little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit, until that flash of lightning hits us. We see it's the Four Noble Truths. You see, it's me, it's in here that I've been cooking up all of this suffering. It's my craving, my ignorance, my desires. This is what's making suffering for me. Letting go of that is peaceful. Yeah. So this is my little talk for you this evening on the first of the first three of the ten fetters.